and welcome to the Rumi Forum. Uh, it's a great program today. I'm really uh, very happy to have been invited, and, and thank you again, Jenna, for inviting me. Uh, we have today the opportunity to talk to uh, one of the religious leaders of our country in Christianity, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to be able to introduce uh, Bishop Chain. Uh, Bishop Chain and I have a little bit of a, of a uh, relationship that goes back in that he and I went to the same high school oh 150 years ago <laughs> long time <laughs> so uh, <coughs> we uh, we ran into each other uh, a few years back and have become uh, good friends I think and yeah. and at least on my part uh, yeah. a great admirer of this man who is doing so much to try to uh, attack a very difficult problem internationally for all of us and I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some of his accomplishments and I told him that I was going to do this and he said it sounds like an obituary so you shouldn't but uh, please let me do this uh, out of respect for this gentleman he's accomplished so much in his life uh, he uh, serves 91 congregations 23 church related schools 45,000 members throughout the District of Columbia and the counties of Prince George's Montgomery Charles and St. Mary's in Maryland uh, he's the president and CEO of the Protestant Episcopal Cathedral Foundation, which oversees the Washington National Cathedral, one of the, the monumental Christian uh, monuments here in the, in the district. Three cathedral schools in St. Albans, the National Cathedral School for Girls and uh, Beauvoir School. Uh, he's been named by Washington Magazine as one of the 150 most influential leaders within the District of Columbia. Uh, and that's saying something because the District of Columbia being the seat of all federal government, uh, there are lots of influential leaders just walk down the street and ask almost anybody and they'll tell you that they're one of them. Um, he's one of the 50 most prominent leaders of the worldwide Anglican commun uh, Communion, graduate of Boston University, Berkeley Center at the Yale Divinity School. Uh, he has uh, been a leader in interfaith dialogue and study, has traveled around the globe. He's just returned from the Middle East where he's been talking with uh, senior officials and members of the clergy uh, in those countries uh, seeking uh, a dialogue among faiths. He's a contributor to the Washington Post on Faith, seri on faith series. Uh, it appears on National Public Radio, BBC Radio, CNN, Fox News, uh, C-SPAN, focusing on Christian as, and Islamic relations. So uh, he has been a remarkable contributor to the idea of peace among uh, uh, the religious community worldwide. And uh, one other thing I should tell you that uh, he is a professional drummer and uh, has been in several well-known rock groups. He probably will talk to me about this afterwards. Later. <laughs> Well-known rock and roll bands. Uh, he, uh, uh, there was a group named after him called the Chain Gang. Uh, and in 2005, he has a CD out entitled The Bishop, His Band, and the Blues. So this uh, gentleman is multi-talented, and uh, please welcome uh, Bishop John Chain. Thank you very much, Bruce. It was an obituary. <laughs> uh, it is an honor to be with you today and to be able to sync schedules so that uh, we all could gather together. Uh, I want to thank Bruce for his uh, kind introduction, uh, also for his friendship, for his significant concern about uh, the shape of the global community today and the impact that uh, not only terrorism but what would be considered somewhat um, uh, fault line religious terrorism has on the future of tomorrow uh, and and the need to address issues that in fact uh, affect all of us which are national uh, security issues as well as international security issues so and I'd like to thank Jenna who has been a good friend over the journey uh, an amazing woman with a great passion uh, who makes so much happen uh, had a chance to meet with uh, the president for a few moments before he went on uh, uh, an interview and so it was wonderful to connect back with him and to get an invitation to meet his his new three-month-old baby girl uh, which was uh, close to uh, entering the world when we had an iftar uh, at Washington National Cathedral and uh, also um, I, I just wanted to say a few words about uh, Dr. Gulen. 
uh, I had no idea that this magnificent man, first of all, had been able in his lifetime, which is certainly not over, he's written 50 books, has probably been one of the greatest voices, scholars, religious person, communicator, about the need to really address not only the role of religion but the place of religion as being an antidote to violence throughout the world and to really stress the importance of coming to the table for dialogue and conversation. Um, he has contributed a lot to the life and stability of the global community already. Uh, his work, I think, has lived out well here. And so I really wanted to make it a point just to recognize him and honor him for the work that he continues to do for the search and the work for global peace among all of God's children. So um, what I'd like to do is just kind of take you down a walk, and I, I don't want to be overly didactic, so please forgive me if I seem that way. I know Bruce will whack me around if I am. I just wanted to, I, I want to talk a little bit about uh, public policy, which is not a new concept, and for those of you who uh, go back in time a little bit, uh, public diplomacy really, if, if we wanted to find a definition for it or an event that defined it, it was uh, the engagement with the United States and uh, the Republic of China uh, some years ago under the Nixon administration when we used to call the beginning of what now is a robust conversation about the future of these two countries and their role in the world. Back then it was called ping pong diplomacy. Um, and I can remember uh, not only that time but during uh, President Carter's tenure I was a chaplain for the United States Olympic team in 1980 and it was the first year that the Chinese sent a delegation to the Winter Olympic Games. Very few of them had any expertise at all in winter sports. Very, none of them had ever been to this, the athletes had never been to this country before, but because of the outreach of this country to that country, they became engaged in what I call an effort at public diplomacy, which not only goes back to the Nixon years, but also to the Carter years. Um, I'll never forget watching the, the Chinese figure skaters uh, trying to figure skate and falling in the great arena and the skiers who couldn't complete the course and the overwhelming uh, joy of seeing these young Chinese athletes trying to figure out what foosball was in the, the, athletes, uh, the athletes' rec area. Nonetheless, uh, in a sense, that's where, for, at least from my perspective, public diplomacy uh, became very robust and very visible. Um, and um, I became intrigued with the role of religion simply because uh, I've had a passion for the Middle East going way back in time to when uh, my presiding bishop, Ed Browning, at that time, and his wife Patty were very much engaged in, in, the, in the challenges that are still on the table regarding the relationship between uh, Israel and Palestine and also the history of the carving up, if you will, of the Middle East. Uh, and then I, I had an opportunity to meet uh, then the Bishop of Jerusalem and uh, now retired and living in California. We had long conversations about how difficult it would be to bring everybody to the table for conversations that might find a way uh, that had not yet been found to bring uh, what in my faith tradition is referred to as uh, a peace that passes all understanding. Uh, I came to Washington and I had a very interesting conversation with Madeleine Albright when I first came here. Um, and, and Madeleine Albright, uh, was, I was talking about r the role of religion in as being the fault line in so much of what we read about and are exposed to on television in terms of what has been defined as terrorism. And, and I will put it out on the table to you and say, if for conversation later, religion is not the cause of, of what we see in the world uh, that we would call um, terrorist activity and the maiming and killing of human beings because nobody has the right to take another person's life in the name of God. Nobody. I don't care what religious tradition you come from. At the same time, however, talking to uh, uh, Madeleine Albright, she, she was in the process of writing a book and she said, when I was a young, tr training to be a young foreign service officer, 
I was instructed never to engage in my work through religious channels. Religion was off the table. It was not to be something that we would be well versed in. Uh, we were not engaged in that part of it. And she said, as I have gotten older and as I have looked at the world around me, she said, I, as I'm writing this book, she said, I am very much aware that times have changed and religion is going to play a very significant role in terms of finding a way to bring people to the table for conversation which then allows trained diplomats to engage in. Uh, and so as a religious person, you know, I don't, I don't presume to be anything other than a religious person and the Bishop of Washington. Uh, I have no diplomatic skills. I just like people. Um, even people that are sometimes considered to be bad people. And um, uh, uh, the former Under Secretary of State uh, Burns uh, said to me one day when I was getting ready to make a trip to Iran, I think it was my third trip, he said I was feeling very, um, very anxious because I knew I was probably going to meet with the leader. And I said, I'm not sure if that's a good idea. And he said, sometimes you have to sit down and break bread with the bad people if, in a sense, you can find a way to open up conversation that has not been undergone by both sides from a political and governmental point of view. Um, so for me, unfortunately, I don't think, and I, and I would say this, and I'm sure there might be some blowback, I don't think those who work at the very highest levels of government, except maybe a few select few, have a clear understanding of religion itself as a mover and shaker in terms of how it can have a huge impact on really addressing the issues that are confronting the global community today. That's number one. Number two, if you don't have at least a very reasonably in-depth understanding, at least of Islam, Christianity, uh, and Judaism, then in fact, conversations become very difficult given where we are um, in terms of the marriage, if you will, of religion and politics. And, and so, um, in many ways, the back channels that have been created uh, through contacts between religious leaders in this country and some of the more troubled parts of the world have been, I think, very, very um, important. I think they have opened up conversation and uh, through other diplomatic channels that kind of hold hands with the religious discourse uh, have been able to see some results uh, in, in some very troubled parts of the world. Um, so I think that it's, it's, it's high time that at least in the country that I know and love and live in that we really get it right and we understand that beyond public diplomacy, religious public diplomacy has a very important part to play in the future of global relations, especially relations that um, are either defined by separation or convergence between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. And um, I'd be interested as we move forward to hear your comments about that. Every major, I worked with a, a great scholar, some of you may know her, Karen Armstrong. Uh, we um, were working on a grant from TED, and uh, we were sequestered. There were uh, 14 of us from every major monotheistic religion uh, that we know of, Abrahamics monotheistics and non-theistic religions and philosophies who were gathered in this tiny little town in Switzerland to begin to look at one word that we thought was a common element that bound all of us together. And what we came to a conclusion to was that compassion is that word. And so that, that gave the birthing, if you will, of what became the Charter of Compassion. And if you really want to take a look at some interesting conversations about how that's interpreted in, in different parts of the world and contr contributions from people who have gone online to make those contributions, why don't you just Google Charter of Compassion and it'll give you uh, an entry point into what has become a very fascinating experience that Karan has uh, undertaken and she continues to work it. Uh, she was here in Washington working with our clergy 
and uh, we went out to dinner afterwards and she still has the fire in her belly as she writes another book. I cannot know where she gets the time to do this. Um, again, um, I think that this is, this is really a tricky part. When we talk about religious public diplomacy, it, it really is a very tricky piece because I really believe that religious leaders, and that's a hard thing, who is a religious leader? And Islam uh, is, uh, is an imam, a leader, well yes, they're, they're a leader of worship within the life of a mosque, but is it a hierarchical religion? No. Uh, Christianity, uh, my denomination is hierarchical. I answer to a much higher authority, but I got to deal with the Archbishop of Canterbury, and I got to deal with the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, and sometimes they can be pretty conflicted, but um, when the Archbishop of Canterbury speaks or the presiding bishop speaks, then they speak on behalf of either the communion and 77 million people or TEC, the Episcopal Church. Not the case in Islam. It's, it's, it's diffused that way and it, it was intended to be that way. Catholicism is the same way. I mean, you, you've got the Pope and then you've got cardinals and then you've got bishops and then yada yada yada. And so when the Holy Father says something about a global issue, it is the position of the Roman Catholic Church, the Catholic Church Universal. So leaders is a, is a very tricky thing to, to, to discern, but I think there has to be a far better relationship between leaders who are engaged, this is not something I need to do, but leaders who really have a passion for this work, religious leaders, to be engaged with uh, their governments, which is another tricky piece, to begin to engage in these kinds of conversations that can be very fruitful. And I would say that um, that that has been the case in this country uh, with uh, the, the past Under Secretary of State, Secretary of State, the current Under Secretary of State, Secretary of State. Um, I went to uh, Kazakhstan last summer uh, as a public member of uh, an official State Department delegation to the OSCE conference uh, and my mission was to address um, to all of the delegates of some 50 countries uh, the place of human rights in the life of this country and the fact that the countries that are member countries of the OSCE need to address those issues if we are ever going to be able to find some common ground about how best to care for one another and how best to continue open conversations as countries with one another. So the, in this country there has been an opening and I, I would conclude this part of my conversation by saying, um, I think it was four years ago, uh, former president of Iran, Hatami, came to the United States and some of you may have been to the cathedral when he came. Um, he was not permitted to leave what is a 30 mile radius uh, out of New York City. It's a diplomatic uh, radius and we wanted him to come to the cathedral but our State Department uh, was a little shaky on it uh, because nobody knew what he was going to say and there's still a lot of wounds from the 1979 revolution uh, and, um, uh, and our diplomats who were held hostage uh, and treated so badly for so long. And uh, one of them is a good Episcopalian at uh, All Saints Chevy Chase, Bruce Langdon. We've had conversation about it. Nonetheless, uh, we called the White House, of all people. We were able to get a hold of President Bush, and President Bush signed the order to allow Hatami to come to continue conversations between two countries that were very much in great opposition with one another. That invitation allowed us to begin to engage in Hatami's dream of what is called the Dialogue of Civilization. That Dialogue of Civilization was an effort to bring together religious leaders and global leaders together to try and find a way uh, to open up communications, to bring a fractured family of nations and religious traditions to the table, not just for conversation, but to deal with the heavy, heavy issues that you read about every day in the newspapers that are very much in the political wheelhouse of every administration and every leadership throughout the world, but especially now as we look at the Middle East. Um, it was Hatami's visit that then, as he was leaving the cathedral under heavy guard, and, and 
for those of you who have been in a public life, some, so to speak, you, you know what it means when somebody wants to kill you. I mean, and, and, um, and so that's been part of my life, is that, that there are those who disagree with things that I have to say. And so we were loading Hatami into the Secret Service and the Capitol Police, and we were loading him into his car to get him out of there. There were a lot of protesters after this event at the cathedral. And I talked to the detail, the head of the detail that was in charge of security, and I said, look at all these, heli the helicopter, and you've got sharpshooters, and you know, we're, we're, we're the cathedral. We don't have a lot of money. We can't pay for this security detail. Who's going to pay for it? He said, well, the government is. I said, well, why was it so, so, so intense? I said, we've had presidents and heads of state here. Uh, we had over 50 heads of state at the Reagan funeral in this cathedral, in the cathedral, in one place at one time. The security detail here was much higher. And he said, well, he said, we had creditable threats against his life and against your life. And I said, well, gee, that's wonderful. I'm going to go out and tell my wife that. Uh, but, but nonetheless, that shows you uh, how passionate people are um, and how long people hold on to these uh, really painful separations between religions and political figures. Um, after those, we had three visits to Iran where we began to flesh out Hatami's vision. Um, part, of the, part of the players in that, those conversations were the former Prime Minister of Norway, um, uh, who was a, is a very good friend, uh, Shel Bondevec, uh, who is the head of the Oslo Center for Peace and Human Rights. And uh, we, we had uh, three conferences in Oslo, Norway, prior to a major conference in Tehran, uh, which was being held just before the elections. Which was, um, and, the, and the theme of that gathering in, in Iran was the, the role of religion and government. Um, its negatives and its positives, which was a fascinating subject to be discussing with a bunch of grand ayatollahs and uh, sh uh, other Shias from different countries and Sunnis, primarily from uh, Egypt and uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, and it was during that time in Iran that I had a, an hour and 15 minute meeting with uh, the Supreme Leader. Um, and that meeting uh, reaffirmed what I think I, I, I had always held close to my heart, which was, as we were leading, leaving, he, he said through his translator, it is extremely important that if no one else has these conversations, religious leaders do, we have to find a way to continue those conversations. And even in the very troubled times that we have with this country right now, as a country, those conversations continue very, very quietly, back-channeled conversations, and had a, telling Bruce that uh, oh, we were conversing, I had a, a very nice letter from the leader just before Christmas, and, uh, and so we will be going back to Iran again to continue our conversations with senior ayatollahs, grand ayatollahs in that country, not necessarily about politics, although politics will always come into play because of the role of uh, Islam and uh, the Iranian government. It's a theocracy. Uh, but because uh, we've been very successful in some ways in working with, uh, uh, um, with Oman and, and other, other places, other countries and other folks to get folks out of Evan prison and we continue to work very hard to see that that happens again because we still have people there that we need to get out. Uh, but again, those conversations would not be happening um, uh, as aggressively as they are right now, I think, without uh, trust levels that have been developed between uh, uh, leading clerics in that country and uh, also the, um, the leader himself. Um, kind of close, I guess, with um, in two weeks, I fly to, uh, to Beirut and then from Beirut drive up to Tripoli to uh, begin the plans for the second Christian Muslim summit. Um, uh, Mamata El Taib from Aliezer University is involved in that. Uh, Sheikh Shahar from Tripoli, who's a very powerful religious leader in that country, will be involved in that. 
the Archbishop of Canterbury is sending representatives to that conference, the planning conference. Uh, Cardinal Turan, who is the head of the interface section of the Vatican, uh, is part of that. And the Pope has made it very clear that these are very critical meetings given the times that we live in. So in September, we will gather uh, uh, high level uh, clerics and academics, both Sunni and Shia, in Tripoli to continue the conversation. But Sheikh Shar, when we were there visiting with him just before Christmas, said, I have always had a dream that this day would come. And he said, I really want to focus on Christian Muslim relationships. I also want to focus on what has been happening recently in Egypt and also in Iraq regarding the Christian communities there. And uh, I had just come from Palestine and Israel and Jordan, and I was going to be going into Gaza to visit one of our hospitals in Gaza, very, very important hospital. And uh, the director of the hospital uh, connected with me up in Jordan and said, you can't come. And I said, well, I got the papers from Israel. I'm good to go. And she said, no, you can't come because there are people who are now coming through the tunnels into Gaza from Egypt who are not connected to Hamas, but who are, t are, who are connected to other communities in Gaza uh, who have made it very clear that their mission is to either capture and or kill Christian leaders who are coming into this part of the world right now. And she said the parallels are, are very striking in terms of what happened in, um, in Egypt uh, and what happened in Iraq. And when I was in uh, Jordan and meeting with members of the royal family, they made it very clear that things were rapidly changing in Jordan. Uh, and there was some real concern. This was before Tunisia. So um, again, I'm going to close with a quote from a, a, an, a, a, an acquaintance that uh, uh, was on the radar screen, uh, who's a Yaley, so we have to hold up uh, the tradition of a, of a great university. Uh, you may disagree with how great it is, but uh, I can assure you that it's very expensive. Uh, this was written by Stephen Carter a long time ago in a book that he put together. And, and it has to do, if you can focus this, at least in our own political life or genre, uh, and it's also, I think, Stephen's talking from a Christian perspective, but I want you to think about it from a much broader perspective on an interfaith uh, a level. And, and Dr. Carter wrote the following. He's talking about threats. And he said, the greater threat that <coughs> comes is when the church, and he's speaking about the church, but we can translate it broadly, is no longer kept merely separate, but is forced into a position of subservience. Its voice disregarded in the greater public discussions or even disqualified from joining them. The real danger is that citizens in general will accept culture's assumption that religious faith has no real bearing on civic responsibility. Should that happen, prevailing cultural mores will have a higher claim on us than do privately held convictions of conscience, however arrived at. When faith is removed from public life, when we divorce religion from politics, we marginalize religion to the point that the values that ultimately guide and help society behave in a reasonable and compassionate fashion are lost the current and prevailing values of the culture. So that's enough to maybe to chew on. I hope I didn't put you to sleep, but it's, it, for me, it's pretty exciting stuff. And uh, there's a lot of it going on. So, Bruce? Uh, Bishop, I'd, I'd like to ask you, I've got 100 questions I could ask you, but I've, I know there's some questions here as well. So I, I boiled it down to two as I was sitting here listening to you, and it's about conversations, and I'd like to ask you for your thoughts about conversations. It seems that we're seeing today across the world uh, increasing hostility in the Christian community towards Islam, increasing hostility in the Islamic community towards Christianity, uh, and 
it seems that so much of what we see are dominated by, uh, let me call it the new media, which has changed in the last decade. Yeah. Uh, we've seen uh, an explosion of, of media organizations that are designed to not necessarily report the news objectively, but to report the news within the context of a particular viewpoint. Uh, and I think there's like 540 satellite television stations in the Middle East now. It's a huge, huge, huge. number. Uh, and so my question is, with all of this, and, as, and I will say this so that you don't, uh, uh, unfortunately, controversy sells. Uh, yeah. If a media outlet, it, it, the, the transition from news to objective reporting to news as entertainment means that the, the value of controversy is increased. So my question is, how do Christians and Muslims of good faith have their voices heard over this oh, uh, noise uh, that, that we see so much of? It isn't easy. Um, and I think that, Bruce, when you talk about the way in which the press has changed. I think it's changed dramatically, and I think it's changed not only the spread of of uh, satellite television and also the way in which it reaches into the entire global community like that. Right. Um, I think a lot changed, and this is going to be my my point of view, my perception. Um, as this country began the build up to the war with Iraq, there was a very significant change in the way in which the press would not listen to the voices of moderation. A bad word to use in the Middle East, but I'll use it from a Western context. Moderation. In, in seeing if there was a way that there might be another alternative given everything that was on the table and given the fact that um, It would literally turn upside down the religious control, if you will, of a country that had been under a somewhat secular Sunni leadership for a long time. Uh, but Sunnis were in a minority, and so the reality was that whatever happens, it's probably going to mean that a government ultimately will be formed, um, but Shias will control that government in one way or another. Now, that was a speculation. The other was, is there a better way to solve the conflict with a guy who was truly a murderer, a dictator, and a real bad guy? No question about it. A bad, bad guy. At a meeting, um, and this is old news for some, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a tough thing to say, but back in 2002, I was new in Washington. I don't know what I was doing. I mean, I didn't, I mean, what do you, I, there's nobody that can teach you how to be a bishop and I'm still learning and by the time I retire, I won't even get it then. But because I was new, I was invited to the Pentagon for a briefing on uh, Afghanistan. So this was in November of 2002. I was elected in June of 2002. And uh, we were being briefed <coughs> on Afghanistan, but as soon as there were only about 10 of us in the room, it was the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, uh, the Lutheran Church, me, um, uh, several others, a lot of brass. And uh, Paul Wolfowitz was there, who was supposed to be an expert on, on Islam and the political realities <coughs> of, of Iraq and the Middle East. And. Uh, Paul said, I don't, I don't want to go any further because I've just had word that um, uh, Mr. Rumsfeld is, is going to be coming back from the White House after a National Security Council meeting, and I want him to talk to you, which was a good thing. And I, I know him because he's a, a parishioner at one of our congregations. And he came, and instead of dealing with Afghanistan, he talked about the visioning for what might happen. It wasn't what would happen, what might happen. Talked about three days of pinpoint bombing shock and awe. Um, and I can share this with you now because we were told anything that said in this room, if it leaves this room, you will never be engaged in the life of the work of this place again. So it was, we all signed on to that at that time. So that's what's going to happen and we'll have boots on the ground and the Iraqis will receive us. 
with open arms, and it will be the emergence of a new democracy in the Middle East, the first real democracy in the Middle East. And my question to him was, uh, have, you, have you thought about the implications, the religious implications of what might happen? Because, because there are going to be some significant shifts in power based on the role of religion in that country. And his response was, that's for the churches to, 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 to determine. That's for the churches to figure out. And I thought, that's not a good enough answer if we're going to commit American lives to a, to a, to a war and if we're going to commit our treasury to a war that might happen. At that time, it was still might happen, mm -hmm. might not happen. Um, so anyway, uh, it became clear that, that, that nobody really had a handle on it. And, and so religious leaders tried to involve the press in looking at other alternatives as well as talking about theological principles that even the most uh, conservative and, 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 and liberal and middle of the road persons could, could agree to, but, but that, you know, the community was saying, hold back, let's have further conversation. And, you know, the Post wouldn't publish anything, Times wouldn't publish anything, President at that point would not see us, so we flew to London and met with Tony Blair for about an hour and 15, not 20 minutes, hour and 20 minutes, with a delegation of religious leaders from around the world, Muslims, Christians, Jews. And it was clear that uh, that uh, the prime minister was committed to supporting the whatever the policy of the United right. States would be. Do you find it? Uh, a, a, do you think it's changed? No, it, I it, think it's gotten worse. It, it's gotten worse. I think it w I don't know if you agree, Bruce, but I think it's gotten a lot worse. Yeah, there's. <coughs> Let me ask you a second question. <laughs> move on. Uh, yeah, also about conversation. Uh, I hear a lot, as I'm sh I'm sure you do, that there is a struggle for Islam, the future of Islam. And it is a struggle between, among uh, Muslims for the direction of the religion, yeah. the direction of the faith. And uh, I also hear a lot uh, from some of my friends, well, th this is a conversation that Muslims must have among themselves. Yeah. Uh, and yet I think that the outcome of that conversation has enormous uh, ramifications for me personally, for my family, for the future. Mm -hmm. uh, because if those who advocate some, let's say, the more extremist views of uh, 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 that have been adopted in some cases, that doesn't portend well for peace in a world without uh, terror. And so my question, uh, and I challenged my friends, I said, well, shouldn't I be a part of that conversation? And more often than not, the answer is no, because you're Christian. Yeah. So I, I, want, I, I want to inquire about your thoughts on that issue, about that conversation. Well, I would agree. I think that we have to be at the table, and I think that there are some very significant players in the global community that, even though we're not dealing with a hierarchy right. in, in Islam, who, who would say that's absolutely essential. There are a lot of others who would disagree, but I think that we're not going to be able to uh, deal with the overriding issues uh, until we come to that place, and we, we, we have done a lot of, a lot of that work. Um, we, we've got to be able to find, and we have found, the very powerful and very simplified common elements that, that say we should be at that table from a theological perspective, from a theological perspective, not a political perspective. And this is the compassion? That it's compassion, but it's also, um, it's the Charter of Compassion. It comes out of the work that's still ongoing at Yale called uh, the Common Word. And w if you look at Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, um, there, are, there, are, there are two sentences, if you will, that are very profoundly centered that should bring us to the table together. One is that we all worship the same God. And in the Christian community, there are people that would love to hack me up and put me away in a bag because they don't agree with that. But, you know, the, you know, the way to find God is through Jesus. But we all worship the same God. Um, and we all are committed, we all are committed to caring for um, uh, loving God with our whole body, soul, and mind, or our whole, our whole being we share those common elements and if you look at Islam and Christianity the, 
you know, I, I wrote the leader a letter and I said, we were beginning of Ramadan, and I said, Ramadan is very much like what I would call the, 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 the role of Holy Lent from a very different perspective, but you know, we're called a deep prayer, okay. we're called a fasting, we're called to break the fast, we're called to do works of compassion and care for the sick, the widows, the broken, and the lost. We share these common elements, and if we have these very simple but very central theological components that bind us together, which are really important, then we have to be at the table. And if we're not, then it's, it's monochromatic. It's <coughs> not going to be helpful. And, and, and how do you see that? I mean, it, I suspect, uh, from listening to you, that, th that many of those conversations are already taking place. And you've described them as behind the scenes or back channel. At what point and how do you bring the, those, that consensus into the mainstream, into the, into the more popular view? I, I think that's been your challenge along with the public diplomacy pieces. How do you, how you bring it into the mainstream? The governments can then start to well, deal with it. I'll give you an example. Uh, you know, it, it, the, the first Christian Muslim summit, which was held in Washington, which came out of that history of right. the, right? Um, it was two and a half days of intense hammering between Sunnis, Shias, and Christians at a hotel, at a disclosed location, but it was off limits. And I got to tell you. So we had some heated discussions. Oh, I got to tell you, we would be in a <laughs> gathering like this. There were 15 principles. There were, f there, were, there were five, one, two, three. There were three principles representing each one of the faiths plus an observe, two observers from, from Judaism, and then five persons who worked with each of the principles to be engaged in these intense conversations about where are we? How do we see each other? So what would happen is the, the Muslims and the Christians would be engaged in a conversation and then the Sunnis would throw up their hands and say, we have to get out of here for 15 minutes. Is there a side room where we can converse? The Shias would be very upset and they would say, I don't know what's wrong with them. And the, <laughs> the, and the Christians would look at each other and the Vatican representative, uh, Cardinal Turan, and I and others would say, gee, we're, we're really doing pretty well here, considering some of the disagreements that we have. Then the Sunnis and the Shias would come back together again and we'd hammer this thing out. For, we hammered out for two and a half days, then we had this gathering at the cathedral. We produced a statement. Statements are statements. But the interesting thing was, you had some very high-level people. al Taib was there um, with the blessings of the Egyptian government. And, at, you know, the press wouldn't cover it, really. The, the press was like this thin. And the reason for it was we came up with a statement that was holistic. Right. And one of the conversations had to do, somebody in the Sunni, uh, Shia delegation said to al Taib in front of the media, well, you don't, you don't like you don't love Shias. And here's El Taib, who's a very powerful man, saying, what do you mean we don't love you? The prophet calls us to love one another. And I'm saying, here's El Taib, who is now probably one of the most powerful people in Egypt, saying that to a leader of a Shia delegation representing Iran. And the press doesn't care. You know, didn't care. So uh, I think it goes back to your observation of uh, if it sells, we'll cover it. Questions? Yes, sir. This has been very interesting, and I just I, I'm John Evans. I was formerly with the State Department, um, and I so many things that you said rang very, very true. Uh, I'm reminded of a an event that took place in the year 2000 when a Russian submarine sank uh, up in the Arctic. And uh, Suzanne Massey, who you might know of, uh, wrote an article at that time called The Submarine in the Cathedral. Yeah. And the point she made was, and I can confirm this, uh, was that here in the government in Washington, we knew every detail of the sinking of that ship, um, more than the Russians actually knew because of all the Cold War array of sensors and so on that we had. But at this, uh, about a week later, there was an enormous event at uh, the rebuilt, rebuilt cathedral in Moscow 
uh, part of the renewal of the Russian church. Mm. And we knew nothing about it because our embassy wasn't aware of it. And there was, I was on the Russia desk at the time and nothing came in about that. And this was, uh, Suzanne Massey did know about it and she wrote that article. Um, I, you have uh, very <coughs> um, discerningly pointed out that we have a tin year when it comes to religion in foreign affairs. And I think that unfortunately is an extension of our separation of church and state. It, it has a lot to do with that. If, if federal employees are overseas, they somehow imagine that they shouldn't do anything that involves religion. Uh, they ought to forget those um, scruples when they cross, uh, cross our borders because they're very important, uh, as, as you have said. Um, I ended up my career in Armenia as ambassador. Oh. Um, and as some people here at the Rumi Forum know, uh, one of the things that I grappled with uh, out there in Armenia was the question of what happened in 1915. Um, and uh, as we see Copts and Syrian Christians and now Armenians also in Iran um, and, and other Christians in the Middle East uh, being forced out of the Middle East, right. where they have been since since Jesus' time. Um, people are, some of the people I know, Armenians, um, are thinking about the time when they were forced out or, or, or massacred. And I'm just wondering if you, if you, if there's anything, th this, this problem seems to be virtually insoluble. There is uh, such accumulated hatred um, uh, on the side, certainly of the Armenians, there's denial on the side of, of many Turks and particularly the government. Mm. Um, it, do you have, is there any point of leverage that you um, know of or can see uh, or can suggest to us as a, as a way? Now, football diplomacy has tried but failed. Yeah. So uh, I'm just wondering from your, your quiver of, of um, arrows if, if there's anything that you might suggest. Thank you. Well, it's a powerful statement um, and a perspective on history and your involvement in the State Department is really important. I really don't have anything that's very hopeful, but I, but nothing can ever happen until we can find a way to get people at the table. And I remember going to Ayatollah Khamenei University to, to, to speak to the students there. And one student stood up and, and, and projected a litany of American interference in that country along with Great Britain for eons, I mean years and years and years, and said how painful it was and how many lives were lost under the leadership of the Shah, which the United States government had, in a sense, embraced. And so therefore, conversations between our two countries could not begin. It was, there's no reason to have conversation. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, well, what you say has truth. What you need to know is what your country did to our country, regardless of whether it was, we're not going to talk about deserved or not. What happened in 1979 is something that continues to find a deep, hollow, dark place in the conscience of American people and in my government. And until such time as we can get at the table and claim that pain and that horror and recognize that it's not a one-way street we're not going to ever get anywhere. We're going to continue to be divided politically. We're going to be divided in terms of our cultures. And we're going to use every excuse in the book not to try and resolve our hatred of one another. And so that's not an answer that's hopeful. But, but I remember that young man who really lectured me. <laughs> and, 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 and he said, well, it was a religious revolution. It wasn't a political revolution. I said, the hell? It was a political revolution as well as a religious revolution. And it, <coughs> hurt, it, it hurt, hurt to the core the psyche of this country. 
and it really did in, in a sense, a president of the United States. So. Sir. Oh my, Romania, Turkey. Mm. Thank you, Bishop Chen. And if the general would allow me, I have three questions and some comments, very brief ones. Uh, number one, what happened since Katami coming here and he launched that program of dialogue civilization, as you are aware, they later on it moving into alliance civilization, and unfortunately, we stepped back and the leadership fell on Spain, Iran, and Turkey. And really, I see that we have totally almost no leadership role in that movement which has so much impact. Mm -hmm. I was just reflecting upon this yesterday when our president met with the Chinese president. If we had an active role in intercultural dialogue, you remember how, how much easier that job would have been when millions of Americans would be more aware of the culture and life there and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So what can we do really to step up and assume a more leadership, greater role in this alliance with civilization which is of such a great benefit to us as a nation leading the world and for the whole world. This is number one. Number two. Could, could, could we ask uh, Bishop Chain to respond to that? It's hard when yeah. you get three questions well, to remember the first. Me get the chance after <laughs> I, I, I let, had let five. Me, let me try and get some folks in because we're, we're running okay. pretty close. To I had five floor. concussions so I can only think at one time on one <laughs> issue uh, as a ball player. What I will say to you is, is, is very simple. Um, and that is that, uh, it, 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 you know, if you're going to build a bridge over a river, both, both constructors have to agree that they're going to do it. I mean, it has been very difficult, and it's going to get even harder now to get the kind of visas that are necessary for people, if you want to use Iran as the example, to get Iranians back into this country for the kind of cultural sharing that's absolutely essential, whether it's athletics, wrestling, art, we had one heck of a time getting the State Department to even move forward to get a visa for not one of the Grand Ayatollahs, but a senior Ayatollah, uh, Damad, to come to this country. They treated him very badly. So that's, you know, we, we have to step up to the plate as well. Yes, ma'am. Hi, um, and thank you for coming and uh, discussing your experience with us. My name is Sierra, and I work um, for a small nonprofit organization called Hasna Incorporated. Um, I wanted to kind of offer up a suggestion um, related to the media comment and then also get your opinion Ooh. on it <laughs> if you'd like to share. Um, something that we've been doing in our work, and I think it's also pretty common um, with other organizations dealing with peace building, is working with youth and social media. Um, we uh, have been running the Cyprus Friendship Program for the last two years, which brings teens from both North and South Cyprus together. Mm -hmm. um, and they live together for four weeks with American families during the summer. And we noticed that they were taking um, their own initiative and continuing to communicate via Facebook and YouTube uh, to meet with each other and to discuss you know, their, their experience in the United States and their experience while living in Cyprus. Um, we've also started conducting media training programs to empower people for citizen journalism. Uh, so I was just wondering um, how you see social media, YouTube, Facebook, and all of those things playing a role um, in supporting <laughs> individuals. That's a tough question for old guys. <laughs> I know. What is that? Well, no, it's, up in, it's really been <laughs> present also in the news. They've been talking more and more about individuals yeah. taking an active role uh, via Facebook, Twitter. We've heard bad things, of course, coming up from these different avenues of social media. But I think that through training with these programs and also bringing the youth, especially, together to meet one another and seeing them continue, that it really has uh, promise. I would say that uh, it, Tunisia was the first cyber revolution, if you will. Um, and if you look at uh, what happen what's been happening in Iran, uh, the use of Twitter, and at least when you can access internet has been very helpful in galvanizing uh, the voices of what we would call the Green Party. Um, I'm not sure if we know, how, I, don't, I don't know how to use it well, I know it has great power and it's a power that's difficult to stop. Do you have any, any information, uh, Bishop Chen, just 
synapse fired here, I wanted to ask a question. Do you, do you have any information that there might be sort of chat rooms out there, interfaith dialogue where right. Muslims and Christians and Jews are kind of talking to each other about you know that. things? Yeah, it, yeah, there what, are. Is there a lot? A lot of chewing, uh, a lot of woofing, as we call it, a lot of great conversation, <coughs> too. And there's no way you can stop it. The, the bottom line is how do you, how do you put it in a pipeline? where it has impact. Because the greatest crime is the crime of silence. And you've got to galvanize those voices. You've got to be able to pull those voices together and then direct them to the places where decision makers are. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, oh, geez. <laughs> Hi, John. <laughs> You've been waiting for a while to do this, haven't you? <laughs> um, with respect to our our moderator, <clears throat> there was an excellent um, paper in the Washington Post this past uh, Sunday, Eisenhower's fa farewell address, yeah, yeah. warning us of the military-industrial complex. We have a hellacious debt in this country, largely because of the way we have handled things and the way we have not been able to bring people together and solve some of the problems that we see in the world, in my opinion. And consequently, I, I think that there are people that profit from dividing us either by religion or ethnicity or whatever it is. And so I think that until we are able to finally get a grasp and begin to bring people together again, the, the three Abrahamic faiths. I'm reminded of that great film that you were in a few years ago, sponsored by the Washington Interfaith Conference, called Three Faiths, One God. An excellent presentation. If anyone hasn't seen it, I would encourage you to contact the Washington Interfaith Conference uh, to, to see if you can get a copy of it. Uh, but I'm concerned that because of our focus and the profitability of having a heavy military, that we will not be able to communicate as we need in order to solve some of these problems between the Abrahamic faiths and other people. Your thoughts? Well, you understand my father was a, a, a naval commander. <laughs> I was in the Navy too. And I was supposed to go to uh, Annapolis, but if you went to Annapolis then you had to spend four years in the Navy and I thought I could play, play pro football, so I, I, I opted out of that, um, unfortunately. But I would say this, uh, I think this country needs to have a strong defense, uh, given the times that we live in, if for no other reason, to be very clear to other nations, uh, that the symbol that we have as a nation which I think is a very powerful symbol. I've always been drawn to it. You, if, I'm sure you've seen it. It's an eagle. And in one of its claws, it has an olive branch. And in its other claw, it has a set of arrows. And the real issue for me in, in that great seal is the balance that's there. And I don't think we can, we cannot get away from that balance. At the same time, I don't think it's a matter of you talk about the debt. I'm not going to talk about the federal debt. I've gotten enough trouble about that. But, but I would say this, that it's not a matter of money to make these things happen. I mean, uh, it's a matter of the will. Uh, and, and the other thing is, you can't get the government to spawn, you know, I would not take a nickel from the federal government as much as it would make it easier for us to make these trips. Because in a sense, it then nullifies the credibility uh, and the trust that's at the table. So we have to go out and find it from foundations, which is painful. I mean, not one cent of money from the Diocese of Washington has ever been spent on any of the work that we've done and the travels that we've made. It's come from individuals. So I think that's the answer. But I just remember the Great Seal. John, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. Uh, we have to move on, and uh, although I think we'd all like to stay here for a while and talk to the bishop, uh, and thank you very much for coming and, and your very gracious presentation and all the work you do. Thank you, Bruce, and thank you. It's good to see you again.